reading from 1 Kings, chapter 17, verse 1 to 11. Now Elijah the Tishwite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering the sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. Thanks so much, Nicola. And let me add my welcome to you. My name is Ben. I'm one of the elders here at the church. Uh, it's great to meet together um, as God's people. Uh, this story from um, 1 Kings, uh, uh, some of Elijah's stories are my favourite stories in the whole Bible. They're amazing. Um, and maybe one day we'll preach through them. It'll be very exciting. But just notice in this story um, how God provides for Elijah, his prophet, through means. First of all, through ravens. So ravens are bringing Elijah ham sandwiches for breakfast and dinner every day because God's instructed them to. And then God provides uh, bread and a drink through this widow. And so what we're going to see when we move to our New Testament passage this morning is how God provides for us through means, through other people, often. And that's exactly what we're going to see this afternoon. Not always ravens, uh, but through people, certainly. So, if you now turn with me to uh, 1 Peter, chapter 4. This is where we've got up to in our series of 1 Peter. Um, we're approaching the end. It's on page 1,220 of the Church Bibles, if you've got one of them. And before we read this passage, uh, why don't I pray for God's help. Father, this is your word, and it is what you want to speak to us, as we will just read in just a moment. Um, the one who speaks should speak as if they're speaking the very words of God. And Father, we are, we are aware that that is, that is a profound truth. These are your words, Lord, so help us to hear them as that. Uh, we need your spirit to understand them, as we've learned recently as well. And we want, Lord, to see the Lord Jesus as we, as we see his word written. And so, Father, help us with all these things, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'm going to read just verses 7 to 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. And above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as the one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do you know, when I was um, preparing this passage this week, uh, I was enjoying it, as I often do. Um, being in the scriptures is, is one of the greatest joys of being a minister. And I was enjoying it, I was thinking about it, and then, then I turned the news on. This was Monday lunchtime. 
and uh, don't know what your hearts and stomachs were like when you saw what was going on in Southport, but um, my stomach just dropped and my heart just was in, just torn within me. It was, it was awful. And a, and a question that came straight to my mind was, how does this passage connect with this world that we're in? If I, was, if I was given this passage to preach at the funeral of one of those three girls, how would this passage connect with this world that we're in? And I was thinking about this, and, and I looked back at the scriptures, and I didn't have to look far to see how this passage connects. And this is why this is the living and active word of God. Look at verse 7 again, the very first verse of this passage. The end of all things is near. Now that's how this passage connects with this wicked world that we're in. And this is good news. That's what I would preach at the funeral of one of these three girls. I would preach that verse and I would say the end of all things is near. And it's good news. Because you see our hope as Christians is not set on this world, is it? When we're looking for hope, when we're looking for answers, when we're looking for uh, something to fix the brokenness, when... We don't have our eyes fixed on this world, but we've seen in this letter over and over again, our hope is set on the end being near. That's where our hope comes from as Christians. The end is near. Let me explain what I mean if you don't really understand why that's good news. The word end here is this Greek word telos, and we've seen this word telos before in this letter. Uh, it means final fulfilment, that's what telos means. It means the end, the goal, the, the finish line. That's what it means. The end, the final fulfilment is near, is what Peter is saying. Telos is the word. And it's kind of where we get the, the word telescope from. It shares a similar root word to tele, which means distant. So when you have a telescope, you're looking at the thing at the end, aren't you? You're looking at the very, the, the very furthest thing away possible. That's what you see through a telescope. You're looking at the end, the final fulfillment. And so it's quite a helpful imagery because Peter has been bringing out a telescope for us week in, week out. And he's been bringing out this telescope and he's saying, look at the end, Christian. Look at the very end. And he began doing this in the very beginning of, of, the, of the letter. So if you turn back and have a look at chapter 1, and look at chapter 1, verse 5, Peter says this, he says, who through faith, chapter 1 verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So there you go, he's got the telescope up. But you know, the best telescopes are the ones that have multiple lenses that pop out like a pirate's one, you know. You know and then you can see really far. And every extra lens further magnifies the thing that you're looking at at the end, doesn't it? So that's what he does. He gets the next lens out. Have a look at chapter 1, verse 7. Here's another lens to the telescope. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's getting us to look again at the telescope. Look at the end, Christian. He does it one final time in chapter 1, verse 13. Have a look at that. He says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope. Where? Where do we set our hope in this world? We set it on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. That's the end. That's the final fulfillment. When Jesus comes back. And that is where he's getting us to hoist the telescope of our hope onto in this dark world. You see, if you look at the world for answers, the best it can do, the best this world can do, is tighter laws, higher surveillance, and limited sentencing. But if the telescope of our hope is set on the return of Jesus, that's good news that the end is near. Because that's where resurrection comes, and that's what this world desperately needs. When there are infants who have been murdered, what this world needs is resurrection. And that's what Jesus is bringing when he comes back. And what this world needs is not a sentence in prison, but it needs judgment. And that's what Jesus is bringing when he comes back. 
And what this world needs is a perfectly run society where there is just peace and children can play safely on streets. That's what this world needs. That's what Jesus brings when he comes back. The end of all things is near. It's good news, guys. It's near. It's near. And so, Peter's got the telescope out again in this verse. And he's getting us to look through it again. And now, having seen that Jesus is coming back soon, he's reminded us of that. It's near. The end of all things is near. He's now going to tell us yet again how to live in light of that. So how do we live now as Christians, given that the end is near? I've got two points this afternoon. First one is this, Eat, Pray, Love. Has anyone seen that film or read that book? It's an atrocious film. I watched it yesterday with Kerry. Awful. If you think differently, I'll argue with you afterwards. It's fine. Eat, Pray, Love. Anyway, we see these three points here in this passage. So my first point has three sub-points. Eat, Pray, Love. Have a look down um, at uh, verse 9. Eat. What do we do? The end is near. What do we do? First of all, we eat. Verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. What Peter's telling us to do. Offer hospitality. Now, hospitality inevitably involves food, um, especially in those times. It would involve food, and it was a very sort of social and intimate affair, hospitality. You would welcome people into your homes. You would recline with them at the table. It's, you know, we, we sometimes have dinner parties, don't we, where we sit around for hours talking, but this was, a, this was a, an extended event in those days and in those cultures. So it's really intimate when he says offer hospitality. This is not just chucking a sort of M&S sandwich out the window at someone as they go by. This is come in, sit down, let me serve you, let me get to know you. I mean, what Peter's really asking us to do here is to be in each other's lives. I think that's what he means. Be in each other's lives. Offer hospitality. But there's a surprising play on words here from Peter. Um, because he says, uh, offer hospitality. And the word hospitality means love the strangers or stranger love. So you've heard of stranger danger. Yeah? Stranger love. That's what this word is. Xenophilia, not xenophobe, but xenophilia. You love foreigners, you love strangers, that's the word. But he's saying, love the stranger, who to? Who do you show stranger love to? To one another, which means the church, he's writing to the church. So he's, he's saying, do you see that play on words? He's saying, he's saying offer stranger love to one another. Um, don't be strangers, is what he's saying. Don't be strangers. Offer stranger love to one another so you're not strangers. But remember, he's also writing uh, to exiles who have been scattered. So in the very beginning of the letter, we read that the, the Christians have been scattered across Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So they're strangers in these countries that they've been scattered to. They're probably strangers to each other. One person has come from one town, another person has come from another town. They've never known each other before, but here they are in the church. It may well be that uh, a sort of exiled Christian, the only support they'll get, the only welcome they'll receive is in the church. And so he's saying, show stranger love to one another. Don't be uh, xenophobes in a world that protests on the street and tells people to go home and burns cars. The church should not be like that. The church should be a place where we love the stranger, we love the foreigner. And so he's saying, don't be strangers to each other. Now, I've got, some, I've got some practical applications for this first one. I don't for the rest, so I'm going to spend longest on this first one. So if you take notes or you write things down, I've got three applications for us on this point. And the first one is, is this. There are new people, you may have noticed, there are new people sort of joining us or coming in through those doors every month here at this church. There's almost always somebody new within a month that, we, that, we, that we're here. And so the first application is be on the lookout to show stranger love to the new people. Love them. They're strangers. Welcome them. And the person who says that's not really my job, that's the elders' job, they, they're misunderstanding who Peter's writing to here. Peter is going to write to the elders, that's chapter 5, but in chapter 4 he's writing to the church still. And he's saying to all of you and me, he's saying show stranger love. 
That's the first thing. Second application here is, is ask yourself this question. This is an interesting question to ask. Ask yourself, who in this church who isn't new, but I would still consider to be a stranger? Is there anyone in this church who I've seen week in, week out for ages, but they're still, to be honest, I don't really know what they do. I don't really know what their family does. I don't know what they like or dislike. <coughs> ask yourself, who isn't new, but I would still consider a stranger? We don't want to become content to consider our brothers and sisters strangers. And the third thing, is um, uh, Peter assumes it's an inconvenience to show hospitality. He assumes that. It's inconvenient to show hospitality. And the reason he assumes that is because he says to do it without grumbling. <laughs> so he knows us very well, doesn't he, Peter? He's like, show hospitality without grumbling, yeah? I know you're going to grumble. Ah, oh, I've got so many other things to do. Oh, I had someone around last week. You know, when Kerry and I first moved here, um, the Marklues brought us around the meal, and they're not here today, so I can embarrass them massively. Um, they brought us around a meal, and I actually don't remember what the meal was. I only remember two things about the meal. One, they brought us little plastic champagne flutes and like a sparkly drink to celebrate moving into our new house. Um, and all of our stuff was in storage. It was arriving the next day, which is why, which is why they gave us plates and cutlery and little plastic champagne flutes. So I remember that, that was special. Kerry and I sat in our empty living room and sort of toasted our mood. The second thing I remember is the smile and the welcome she gave me as I answered the door and she handed it over. Um, she showed such a stranger love to me. She didn't know me, I didn't know her. But the smile on her face and the welcome she gave made that meal so sweet and just put me and Kerry at ease, being in a new place without any lost stuff having left our old lives behind. Um, it could have been, if, if she had grumbled as she dropped it off and gone, oh, I'm just, this is annoying me, I've got so many other things to do. You can't, you know, can't you go to, there's a, there's, a, there's a McDonald's there, I mean, you live in Burgess Hill, come on. Why live in Burgess Hill if you're not going to McDonald's? She could have done that, but she didn't. She smiled, she welcomed, and that meal was so sweet for that reason. And so the person who says, you know what, I will, I will be hospitable when it's more convenient, when work's less busy, when kids are a bit older, uh, when you know, we've tidied up a little bit. I think, I think if we think like that, we've misunderstood what Peter is asking us to do. It's inconvenient. Uh, it's going to get in the way, but it's what we ought to do. Somebody once explained to me the difference between entertainment and hospitality. Very helpful, so I'll just share it with you briefly. Um, entertainment is when you uh, you've cleaned the house and people are coming over. You know, you've got you've laid the table, you've bought garlic bread, you've got nice drinks, you've you've laid the table nicely, you've cleaned the bathroom. You know, that's hosp that's entertainment. Hospitality is just we've we've probably got enough pasta here to feed one or two more people. Uh, I haven't hoovered, sorry. The cat has thrown up on the doorstep, so you'll have to tread over that when you come in. There's probably a poo floating in the toilet, I'm really sorry, but I haven't had time to flush it or clean it. That's hospitality. It's just, come in, have us as we are, there's Duplo on the floor, I'm sorry you're going to have to step over it. That's hospitality. Not entertainment, that's hospitality. And that's the sort of thing that Peter is asking us to do. Don't wait until it's convenient to show stranger love. Otherwise the Lord might return suddenly and find us still waiting to do that thing that he's asked us to do. And so, final application, if you're writing things down, make a list of people that are strangers in this church to you and have them over this summer. Why don't you do that? Kerry and I have got this, so if you hear from us, you're a stranger to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. That's eat. Next, pray. It'll be quicker the next couple. Pray. Verse 7. Have a look at verse 7. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. See, Peter is, is wanting us to notice if we're not alert, if we're not sober minds, we're not going to pray. We heard last week, Bob spoke to us about the dangers of slipping back into old sins and our old lives, and living as the world wants us to live. And do you know what the first thing to go normally when somebody slips back into old sins is? What's the first thing to go, do you think? Because normally people will still come to church if they've got sins going on underneath. 
They still go to community group. They still give to the church financially. They're still on rotors. They still serve. It's normally the unseen prayer that's the first thing to go. When people slip back into old habits or worldly lives. Prayer. Prayer is the canary in the coal mine of your spiritual life. Um, it's, an, it's a well-known uh, analogy. If you don't know it, miners used to take little canary birds into the mines with them. Because when they were mining, there would be sudden releases of carbon monoxide, which is deadly. But the little canary birds would breathe quicker, and they're smaller, so they get affected by the carbon monoxide quicker, and then they would drop down dead, <laughs> or just get very ill and keel over. And then the miners would know there's carbon monoxide, we need to get out, we need to leave, there's danger. Well, prayer is the canary in the coal mine of your spiritual life. How is your canary doing? How's your prayer doing, in other words? Is it alive and well? Is it singing? Or is it a bit droopy? Is it keeled over completely? I don't think Peter is just sort of reprimanding us here, but he wants us, doesn't he, to look through the telescope. Look, guys, remember, the end is near. Jesus is coming back. He's, we're closer to Jesus coming back now than when this sermon first began. We're closer to Jesus returning now than when we woke up this morning. We're closer to Jesus returning now than, than uh, the camps that we were on last week. We're closer now. The end is near. And so, wake up if you're asleep. Get that canary bird awake again. Get it to look at Christ. You know, when he comes back, who's he coming back for? He's coming back for you. He's coming to take you to live with him forever and to be with him. He's coming to bring you every blessing and usher you into his eternal kingdom. That's what he's coming to do. And so let's pray. Let's pray that, let's pray for ourselves that we would be faithful. Let's pray for those around us that they would stay faithful. Let's pray for the lost that they would come in before Christ returns. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Eat, pray. Thirdly, love. Have a look at verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Peter is banging the drum of love, isn't it? Love. He's said it many times. Um, fundamentally, this is what it means to be a Christian. If you're a Christian and you do all sorts of Christian things and you're at church today and you're sat here listening, but you don't love, well, Paul says in Romans, I have nothing. I am nothing. Love is fundamentally above all else. Look at verse 8. Above all. Above all. Which means before everything else. So he's almost like saying, forget everything else I've said. If you're not doing this, don't bother doing anything else. Above all, love each other deeply. And we've seen this expression before in the letter. Do you remember it means a love that's stretched all the way out like a rope? That's what it means to love each other deeply. Like, let the anchor go all the way down, let the anchor of love drop. That's the kind of love that we should have for one another. And he gives us a reason here. Why? You say, well, Peter, why should I love someone that much? Because love covers over sins, that's what he says. A multitude of sins. You see this in parenting. Young people, you're on summer holidays now. How many sins have you committed that your parents have had to forgive out of love the last couple of weeks? Uh, maybe you're doing all right so far, but by the end of the summer, are you going to have driven your parents mad? <laughs> are you going to have disobeyed and not listened and lied or got frustrated and done your own thing? Parents cover over the sins of their children because they love them. So, soul, your parents love you. Yeah, the mountains of sins in your history they've just covered over because they love you. Where else do we see love covering over sins? Marriages. Do we not see that? We sin, we sin to each other in marriage. We upset each other. We, we bicker. We fall out. But love is what covers over those sins. Most of all, we see this in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? He is the one who loved us and gave his life for us. Why? So that our sins would be covered. So that his blood would be shed to cover our sins to bury them in the ground so that he can never see them or remember them any longer. The Lord Jesus Christ loves us and gave himself for us. This is how we know what love is, that Christ died for us 
This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice to cover our sins. That's love. That's what love does. And that's the kind of love we ought to have for one another. So, eat, pray, love, because the end is near. That's the first thing that Peter is telling us to do. The second thing is he's telling us is this. Your gifts are not yours. Did you know that? Your gifts are not yours. If I asked you, what's your gift, what would you say? You know, people say I'm gifted at this. What is it? What's, what's your gift, your thing? Normally, when people say they're gifted, it, what they mean is they have something that's blessed them. Um, you know, they have a, a characteristic or a quality or a talent uh, that they have, and it's a great blessing, and they're told not to waste their gift, but to fulfill its potential. You know, so Simone Biles, wow, she's gifted, isn't she? what we say. So imagine it's Christmas Day, Simone comes downstairs and under the Christmas tree is a gift and it says to Simone and, it, and the gift is to be a world class gymnast. That's what the gift is. Yeah, you saw her with her goat necklace, anyone see that? Yeah, she knows she's gifted. People tell her she's gifted. That's how we normally speak about gifts. But you know, Peter speaks very differently about gifts. He says actually the gift is not actually for you. So it's Christmas Day, you've come downstairs, under the tree you see a gift, you pick it up and it says, to my beloved on it, and it's given to you to deliver the gift to God's beloved. That's what we see here. And actually, I want to convince you in the next few minutes that this is wonderful to see this, because here we see God's love for you. This is where we see God's love for you, and I want to show you this in the next few minutes. Now have a look at verse 10. Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. <coughs> okay, so Peter is saying God is dispensing gracious grace in various forms to his church. That's what he's doing. God is showering his church with love and gifts. But how is he giving this grace to his church? He's giving it through people. Do you remember Elijah? The ravens were what bought him the sandwiches. The woman was what bought him bread. The grace, the gift was for Elijah, but it came via ravens and via the woman. Well, that's what's sort of going on here. Another way of saying this is, is you are managers of God's grace in its various forms. That's another word for steward, if you don't understand what steward is. You're a manager. So God has given grace to you to manage as you give it out to those who he intends to receive it. There's a parable that's really helpful with this in Luke chapter 12. Jesus says this, he says, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his, his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? So in this parable... Uh, we've got a master who has servants, and he cares about the servants, he wants to feed the servants, and so he puts a manager in, and he gives all the food to the manager to give to the servants. That's this parable. So the manager is given the food, but it's not for him, it's for the servants. And then Jesus goes on, he says, it will be good for that manager whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the manager says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that manager will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And so Jesus says, on the one hand, it will be good for the manager who the master finds him doing so, but the manager who thinks that the gift is for himself who eats and drinks and gets drunk on the food that was meant for the servants, he is assigned a place with the unbelievers. And I think that's what Peter is saying here. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he's saying, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. You're faithful managers of God's grace in its various forms. So you might hear people say things like, um, I work all week as a teacher, so I can't teach Sunday school, it's my day off. Or, you know, I spend all week talking to new people, I don't have to do that at church. 
Or, you know, I've got some inheritance, I've got a bonus at work, I don't really want to tithe any of that. Or, you know, I like to keep my home and church separate, I don't like to mix those two things, I don't want to host a community group. I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what your gifts are for, and who your gifts are for. Your gifts are not yours. They're given to you to serve the church. The church is the intended recipient of your gift. But God's given it to you to manage, to give it to the ones. And actually, if we, if, we think, if we think our gifts are for us, then we miss God's immense love for us. Let me convince you of this again. If we think our gifts are only for us, we miss God's amazing love for us. Because what's, what starts to happen when you look around you and you see gifts in the church? You become envious. You go, oh, why have they got that gift? Why has God given them that gift and not me? Why are they so talented in that way and I am not talented in that way? You start to look around and you misunderstand it. It's the other way around completely. God so loves you, he's given them that gift that they might serve you. You are the recipient of the gifts in this church. So when Jez and Paul come up here and play music for us, yes, they're gifted, but you're the recipient of that gift. God wants to bless you and so he's given them that gift that you might be blessed by God's love. You see? Don't be envious of people, in other words. If you look around you and you see talented, gifted people, you should think, wow, God loves me. God's grace to me and through all these people. Wow, God loves me. There's another example of this here in verse 11. He says, if anyone speaks, they should do so as the one who speaks the very words of God. And so Paul preached to us last week, didn't he? But not really. It was God who spoke to us. And so again, here we see that God is the one who speaks, but he speaks through a mouthpiece, who's the preacher, Bob last week. But, but the, the recipients of the gift is the church. Peter knows this very well. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus, the good shepherd said to Peter the Apostle, feed my sheep. And so Jesus wants to feed his sheep. How does he do it? Through the gifted apostolic teacher that was Peter. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a youth week leader, if you're a community group leader, if you do one-to-ones, if you encourage people, you have given that gift that you might serve and teach the church. Almost there. Here's an ironic thing. You know when people say this? They say, um, they look at someone who's talented and they know it, and they say, oh, he thinks he's God's gift to the world. And when people say that, he thinks he's God's gift. The ironic thing is they're half right. They're actually half right about that. The full truth is that they've been stewarded the gift of God to the world. They are God's gift, but they're managers of the gift, stewards of the gift. That's, the, that's where they get it wrong. So if you look at the second half of verse 11, uh, Peter goes on, he says, If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. See, the problem comes, doesn't it, in this world, when people think they are the gift, and they're not just managers of the gift. When they think they should get the praise instead of God who's given them that gift. And so they want the church to look at them and go, Praise me. No, that's a big issue. We want to be people who say, look at what God has given you. Wow, praise God. In all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So whether you teach or whether you serve, it all comes from the Lord, so that in all things he's praised. So back to the Christmas Day illustration. You've gone downstairs. Under the tree is a gift. And it says, to my beloved church, love God. But then you are given that gift to manage and steward, to deliver to the church. So as we finish, what is your gift? What is your gift? When I asked you earlier, and you thought, this is my gift, what is that? Are you using it to eat, pray, and love for the glory of God? Do you have a gift of hospitality? Do you love to cook? Do you love to host? Well, that's the gift God has given you to feed his people. Do you love to pray? You have the gift of prayer, in a sense. Well, that is the gift of God to, for you to petition the throne of grace on behalf of the church. We're all good prayers for ourselves and our families. Pray for the church. Do you have the gift of love? This is the gift that God has given you, that you would let the anchor all the way down for the church. 
And you know, I just finished with this thought. As you read the Gospels, you encounter Jesus Christ, who was the most gifted man in all of history. He only ever used his gifts to serve and admonish and feed and build up other people. He came full of grace and truth, John writes. Jesus ate, Jesus prayed, Jesus loved, and Jesus gave the gift of himself for us, and he did it all without grumbling. And he's coming back with more grace. And so I'll leave you where I started. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Set your hope, get that telescope of hope out. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The end of all things is near. It will be good for those managers whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I'm going to give you just a, a few moments of silence now to reflect in your heart and think. Um, how do I need help, Lord? I need help with this. How, in what ways do you need help to, to do these things? And then also, thank God in your hearts now for his great love for you, for blessing you with gifted uh, people in this church. Because you are the end intended recipient of all the gifts God has ever given his church. That you would be blessed. Father in heaven, we, um, we acknowledge before you that so often we set our hope on this world, on the next paycheck or the next holiday or the next life stage, and we, we fail to set our hope um, on the end, the final fulfillment, the return of the Lord Jesus. Father, help us to do that. And as we do that, would you give us strength um, to live in this world as you want us to, to be generous in hospitality, to be generous in prayer, to be generous in love for one another. Father, help us not to hold on to our gifts for ourselves or merely to serve ourselves, but would you give us the right attitude and frame of mind and perspective that we would want to use our gifts to serve the intended recipients, your beloved church. Help us, Lord, if we feel unloved and ungifted to look around us and see your amazing love for us in the provision of gifts all around us which are for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.